Well, welcome back to First Baptist Church. After taking a pause, it feels good to be back, doesn't it? And so Alyssa is back with us. Alyssa, we have reserved this whole section for Alyssa. So, sorry. She hates that to be. <laughs> I'm going to be in trouble. <laughs> Cody's laughing on the line. You know, it's just like, shut up, James. You're going to get yourself in trouble. Anyway, I will be quiet. Good morning. Welcome to our church. Glad you could be with us. We are glad to be back after a two week pause. Everyone is doing well. So, no new exposure, no new cases, no new nothing. So, God has really protected us. So, thank you guys for your patience and grace. I know it's not easy to pause like that. And We all want to be back in church, but uh, we want to act with wisdom and integrity uh, during this season because not only do we want to protect our congregation, we want to protect others, but we also know that we have a reputation for the gospel and our community that we must maintain. So there's, anyway, thank you for being with us. Not many announcements, uh, just so you know, we're hoping to just our shot in the dark to kind of getting back to some sense of uh, normalcy um, is our Easter Sunday in the Sunday after Easter. We're hoping to start with our teams, uh, launch our discipleship classes and things like that. So r- right now the first service says hello. Uh, I think we had 20 or so believers with us this morning and they miss you guys. So I always tell them you guys say hello and they say hello. So the, from the first service they said hello to you guys. And so they said they're, they're the much more spiritual bunch, and they're good that this separation has allowed them to advance in their holiness away from you guys, and uh, <laughs> no, they didn't say that. So welcome those that are watching online at home, and we're glad you could be with us. So uh, we gather, we have two services on Sunday, and then our small groups. We meet mo- Monday through Thursday uh, on our small groups. They're all meet right here in the building, so uh, we'd love for you to connect. Uh, if you'd like to connect with our church, we have several small groups. It's all on our website. If you want to check out our website, Facebook page, all the time, services, places. For our small groups, it's a good way to make the big congregation feel small and make it become like a family. So we'd love for you, and that's how we carry out our mission as a church. That's how we love our neighbors. Uh, that's how we minister to one another. That's how we care for one another. That's how we live out Acts 2 in our church is through our small groups. So if you're not... Um, involved in a small group. The next step is church discipline. So um, I'm sassy this morning. I'm sassy this morning. I better quit. All right, let's pray. Uh, We're going to read the scripture. We're going to pray, read the scripture, sing, and then we're going to jump into God's word. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you are good. Lord, you have redeemed us on no merit of our own, no will of our own, yet by grace you saved the dead. And you raised us to new life in Christ. And we are your purchased possession. And Lord, we are here to worship you. And Lord, we gather for no other purpose than our hearts to be changed, for you to receive glory. And Father, that our hearts would just sing as we hear the truths read and we see the truths through the words that we sing and through the scriptures, Father, that you would be exalted, you would be seen for who you truly are. Lord, let our eyes see you exalted. Let us see you for who you are, and let our hearts be changed this morning. Father, we can do nothing apart from your Spirit, so we ask. Now, we plead that your Spirit would be at work through all aspects of our gathering. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. So if you join me in reading this morning's call to worship, our scripture reading that will call us to worship and Psalms chapter 96, verses 1 through 4. Let's read together. Sing a new song to the Lord. Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord. Praise His name. Each day proclaim the good news that He saves. Publish His glorious deeds among the nations. Tell everyone about the amazing things He does. Great is the Lord. He is most worthy of praise. He is to be feared above all gods.
next song and listen. I'll sing through the first verse as it's our church's first time singing, O Church Arise. And feel free to join me on verse number two.
I love songs that are full of doctrine and truth because we can sing songs that are full of emotion. There's nothing wrong with emotion, but true joy and emotion comes from an understanding of the truth that we sing. And because truth is that foundation, we know it's firm, and we can rest in the firm foundation of God's truth, and that is what brings lasting joy and peace. When we sing songs that are true and full of truth and doctrine, it brings this joy that is not easily taken away. So we're going to continue in our series uh, reset, uh, gospel reset, and we've looked and compared the church of the 21st century to the church that we see in the the ancient church, the early church, and how they are vastly different. The first week we looked at what is the church and how it is the assembling of believers. It has nothing to do with bricks and mortars and buildings and service times, anything like that. The church is the people of God, and we saw that the people of God had one thing in common. It was a confession. It was a common confession. And this common confession was that Christ is Lord, that he is Lord, that he has risen from the dead, and they were a movement. The church was not bricks and mortar and buildings and service times and something that you come to. The church was a movement of the gospel through people that had a common confession. And so we've seen that, and then we talked about how we pray and how the early church would pray for boldness in the face of opposition. They didn't hide. They didn't cower. They prayed for boldness, and they prayed not prayers that God bless me, God you know, help me to sleep good, God do this for me. They prayed prayers that were bold and big, that, that they prayed for boldness, that they would speak the truth. And it was not really centered on us. And then we talked last week about the boldness and how the church is not about violent revolution, that the working of God is not through violence, it is not through a political ideology, that the church is about regeneration and not about revolution. And we sung about it today, O church, arise, let our message be one of the gospel and one of love. And that is the message of the church, that there was these two warring political ideologies between Rome and Jerusalem, the Jews, and how that was a tender balance. And this early movement of the church was creating a stir, and they're like, oh, is this new group of people going to rise up to power? And the church was never about power or having dominion over people. It was about the gospel message and how they loved those that even oppressed them. And though they met before the Sanhedrin, hey, stop preaching the gospel. They were like, we're going to obey God rather than men, and we're going to preach the gospel. And that's what we're going to do as a church. We're going to love our neighbors, and we're going to preach the gospel. And so this week, um, this one's going to be fun, okay? I'm looking forward to it. Uh, let, me, let me give you an asterisk. Now, a lot of people tell me not to do this because it puts everyone on edge. Let me give you an asterisk. Listen to everything that I say. <laughs> That's irony of a pastor telling you to listen to every word. But really do. If you like fall asleep through a part of it, you're going to be missing the whole thing. It all will come together, okay? So anyway, we're looking at barriers to the gospel. Now, we know ultimately God has chosen us before the foundation of the world that, there, that his kingdom will come. But I want you to look at some cultural barriers that we need to really rethink. And we're going to see it in this text because... You know, as this movement of people, uh, as this, uh, we saw that this was taking place, Pentecost, 5,000 people had been empowered by the Holy Spirit, God's people. There was this motion, this uproar in the city, this delicate power of balance. We've seen that this was movement, but we see here that there was a leader in this persecution. After the church, and this uproar, there began this persecution and oppression of the church. And do you know who in the book of Acts, we're in the book of Acts, we haven't been with us, who this main... Um, persecutor it was. You guys probably know him as Saul, and we all know what happened. So in this persecution, you've seen in Acts 6, 6 we're going to skip a couple of chapters, and uh, we're going to be in Acts 15 this, this week, but in Acts 6, uh, the pastors, uh, the elders of the church were saying we should not neglect uh, the ministry of the word and prayer because there was a bunch of needs within the church, so let us call up other leaders in the church that we may meet the needs. And then Stephen, uh, the, the first deacon or elder that you want to see in the scriptures came and was stoned and the person that led that persecution or the killing of Stephen was Saul. Saul uh, ultimately we see early in this chapter was converted on the Damascus road. He was on this road to per per persecute the church and guess what happened? There was a pastor on the road that says if you want to pray a prayer raise your hand. 
No, what happened? God showed up and there's a light. Why are you persecuting me? Paul, he said, Lord, he believed. It was a miraculous conversion, all by God's grace, not by man, the will of man. And so we see Paul or Saul converted into Paul. And then he goes from persecution to what? Missionary. And so you see him leading his first missionary journey. So I want you to see this, the timeline of the book of Acts is, is, is this great movement. 5,000 people, uproar in Jerusalem, oppression, scattering, a conversion of Paul. There was some structure added with pastors and uh, elders in the church and, you know, taking care of the needs of the people. You've seen some added structure. So about 20 years later is where we find ourselves, 48, 50 AD, find ourselves in this chapter. What has already happened, it has the, the movement of the gospel, has now already started to take an inward focus. And it, it has started to st- it's stopping to become this movement of people, and it's now becoming this inward focused. And, and what it's doing is it is bringing the church within walls and barriers and rules and tradition. And so what you're seeing is this gospel advancement is now being corralled. I thought about using the word quarantine, but that might be a little touchy. Um, And so there's back in Jerusalem after Paul's missionary journey. I won't show you on a map or anything, but they're back in Jerusalem. And then there's this controversy that is arising. And this controversy starts here, and it has been a cancer on the church of Jesus Christ ever since this day. What you're going to see in this text is nothing that we haven't seen or dealing with already in the church of Jesus Christ today. But it is one of the most important things that we must attack that is rarely attacked. Um, But this is deadly. And so we're going to see this today. What you're going to basically see is how good do you really have to be to be part of a gathering of believers, right? What's expected of me? What should real, true Christians, what should they do? And how should they live? And what should they act like, right? And so this is that controversy that is coming up because, you know, we have this rebel, you know, this guy that thinks, you know, he's this, he's radically converted. Now he thinks he has all authority to go preach the gospel to the Gentiles, Well, Jesus was a Jewish Messiah who fulfilled Jewish prophecies. So if you're going to be a real Christian, you must be Jewish. And you must obey, you know, 613 laws, both custom and dietary laws. And, you know, you must observe the Sabbath. And we'll, we'll get there. I'm getting ahead of myself. But many people assume that Jesus was Jewish and he fulfilled Jewish prophecy. So to, to become a true Christian, you must become Jewish. And so let me guess, most of your hunches, uh, the hunch that I have is most of you that have had to deal with church issues, do you know what they probably stem from? Is people imposing um, extra man-made rules upon you instead of being a church that is both grace and truth. John, the apostle, said that Jesus was this perfect embodiment. He was a picture of grace and truth. And let me tell you something. Churches, naturally, you have to work very hard to avoid two dangerous traps. One is to flow into a church that is all truth with no grace. But there's also an equal danger as drifting into a church that is all grace but no truth. And left to itself, a church will drift one way or another. We must work extremely hard to walk this balanced biblical ground where grace and truth are not in confliction with one another, but they coexist together. Does that make sense? Because like Bernie Sanders out there. But Jesus was both grace and truth. I'll cut out my corny jokes and stick to the word, okay? I'm sorry. But the church is 20 years old. 48, 50 AD, and they've already went from this great movement of the gospel to this inward focus, controversy, conflict over rules. And so let's look at Acts 15. Let's jump into the text. Acts 15. It's up on the screen. If you don't have your Bibles, there's a Bible in front of you. If you want to look up the screen uh, for the people online, it should be up on your screen. Acts 15, verse 1. I'm going to read through it, and then I'll try to restrain myself from preaching while I'm reading. Acts 15, verse 1, watch this. So while Paul and Barnabas, they're coming back from their first missionary journey, were at Antioch of Syria, some men from Judea arrived and began to teach the believers. Here it is. What are they teaching? Unless you are circumcised as required by the law of Moses, you cannot be saved. Imagine that membership class. Unless you want to be part of our church, 
It was all men and children, or women and children. No men wanted to join that church. Okay. Paul and Barnabas disagreed with them, arguing vehemently. Conflict, right? Was it over? The laws, the traditions, the rules. Uh, Paul and Barnabas disagreed with them vehemently. He said, finally, the church decided to send Paul and Barnabas to Jerusalem. All right, go talk to the high church. Let's have you work it out with uh, James over there in Jerusalem. He said, accompanied by some local believers, to talk to the apostles and elders about this question. What was the question? What does it mean to be a true believer? You can't be a true believer if you don't adhere to the law of Moses. Paul argued. So he's heading to Jerusalem. So the church sent the delegates to Jerusalem. And when they stopped along the way in Phoenicia and Samaria to visit the believers, so they're not in Jerusalem yet. They're in pretty much predominantly Gentile areas. Paul's a missionary coming into these churches, giving a missionary update, okay? This is what's happening. And so he comes, and then he told them to much to everyone's what? This is important. Do you see this? Because the church in Jerusalem doesn't quite react this way. They told them to much everyone joys that the Gentiles were being converted. There was a lot of people being saved and baptized and discipled in these predominantly Gentile churches. What did they do? That's great. That's awesome. People are being saved. Hallelujah. God's at work, right? That's what they're doing. It's in there. It's not in there. It's in there. When they arrived in Jerusalem, watch the different reaction. Barnabas and Paul were welcomed. You can just sense the coldness. It's like, oh, we're a little suspicious of this guy. We're welcomed by the whole church, including the apostles and elders. So they gave this same missionary report. They reported everything God had done through them, right? This great amount of conversions. Watch this. Here it is. But some of the believers. Can you just see this piety here? But some of the believers, they, they weren't reacting in joy, but some of the believers who belong to the section of the Pharisees, they stood up. Can you just sense this? Okay. And they insisted, the Gentile converts must be circumcised and required to follow the law of Moses. This is singular. They're, they're literally meaning 613 different laws. So for you to be a Christian, You must be circumcised and obey 613 different laws. If you don't, you're not a true Christian. Look at the next. At the meeting, after a long discussion, Peter stood up and addressed them as follows. Brothers, brothers, you all know that God chose me from among you some time ago to preach to the Gentiles so that they could hear the good news and believe. He's talking about Acts 2, the day of Pentecost. God knows people's hearts. And he confirmed that he accepts Gentiles by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. There is no difference between Jew and Gentile. Look what he said. He made no distinction between us and them. Why? This is that common message of the church, right? Here's our confession that we've been talking about. For he has cleansed their hearts through faith. Faith plus anything? Faith plus being circumcised. Faith plus any of the 1613 laws or just faith. So the Bible is saying your hearts are made right and approved with God by faith alone, right? The church should say amen, right? Thank you. So why are you now challenging God? The other uh, other, uh, versions will say, why are you testing God? Very dangerous to add to the gospel. We do it a lot. Are you now challenging God or testing God by burdening the Gentile believers? Do you know what that is? Barriers. That's what we're talking about. Removing barriers to the gospel. Why are you making it difficult for Gentile believers with a yoke that neither you nor your ancestors were able to bear? What was the purpose of God's law? Do you know? The purpose of God's law is for you to read it and obey every single one of them perfectly. And if you fail, you're out. No. What was the purpose of the law? The purpose of the law is when you read God's law, it's never meant for you to say, hmm, I think I could keep all of these things and do them perfectly, so then I will be accepted before God. Isn't God lucky to have me? Because look how good I am. No, the purpose of the law is to reveal to you. It's a mirror that reveals to you how bad you are. And then apart from God's radical grace, you are actually really deserving of separation from God for eternity. That's what the law is supposed to do, and it's just to break you and to show you that apart from God's grace, I have no hope, right? It's the purpose of the law. But these people are telling you you have to keep it to be a Christian. 
they're adding man's traditions, man's commandments to the gospel and making it difficult for Gentiles to come into the church. He says, neither are our ancestors were able to bear. Go ahead, sorry. We believe that we are all saved the same way by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus. Do you agree with that? All right, let's jump in. I want you to see in verse 1, uh, did you see how quickly this movement has turned from uh, a movement to the gospel, to missionary journeys, to seeing 5,000, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 people scattered, new churches started in, in Phoenicia and all over the place with this scattering, and there's people coming to Christ, and then Paul comes in, and he's like, you know, you wouldn't believe it. We're out in the streets, and we're preaching the gospel, and people are responding, and they're coming to faith. It's a great movement, and these Gentile believers are, woo, that's great to hear, hallelujah. They're, they're saying amen, they're agreeing, but then he comes to Jerusalem and then these Pharisees or these, these men that think that when we hear the fear word Pharisee, we're kind of like, oh, these are really evil, black, you know, stained people. They didn't view them as that. These are like the elite guys. These are like, you know, they earned PhDs, memorized the first seven books of the Bible. Like these dudes got it. They're, they're holy. They wear the robes. They ro wear the garb. They got the phylacteries. They, they got scripture memorized and they walk through the streets, you know, and they got the, the holy man look. You know what that is? No? All right. But do you see how quickly this movement has changed? They're saying you're not right with God unless you do this. You know what it sounds like in our day and age? It sounds like this. If you're a true Christian, you can't do this. You can't do that. You can't listen to this. You can't use that instrument. It's rules, 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 rules. Can I say it this way? Barrier, barrier, barrier barrier. You can't come in unless you do X, Y, and Z because this church is, you know, we're holy and we're good and, you know, we have this rule and that rule. And let me tell you all about our rules. Then you can, once you go through our, uh, you know, 618 week membership class where we discuss all the rules, then you can be a part of our church if you perfectly adhere to all these. What a joke. It amazes me though. It amazes me how, how some people, we have so many rules in our church gatherings that we get wound up tight about. But we never seem to get wound up tight because we're not making disciples. Heaven forbid we talk about the carpet or the thermostat or what someone wears, you know, oh, that we'll get real wound up about that. But people are never really getting wound up. Oh, man, we should really get wound up because disciples aren't being made, uh, because people aren't being baptized, or people, uh, you know, we're not seeing conversion, we're not seeing boldness, we're not seeing radical movements. We're not wound up about those things, but we're wound up about silly rules, traditions, aren't we? We're not wound up about anything else other than those things. You know why? Because the churches that are like that have stopped being movements and now have turned inward to where it's all about them. It's all about what they get and what they want. Be careful. This is what destroys churches. Don't you dare talk about church carpet, service times, traditions, but let me tell you something. You know why? This is why there are 17 churches in Genesee County. If something isn't radically changed in these churches, they will close this year or next. You know that. Just in our county. Do you know why? It's because the people have stopped moving outward, and it's all focused about what's going on inward. It's not, no longer about reaching them. It's all about comforting us. It's about surrounding us with people that think like us, talk like us, believe like us. It's all about us, and we don't want anyone from the outside upsetting that. So if you're going to come and be a part of this, you've got to believe this way and do this way, talk this way. Dangerous. Then what happens? Look with me in verse number two. This brought Paul and Barnabas into a sharp dispute. Doesn't pride always breed contention? It's no different. When churches are outsider-focused, you know what they don't have in their churches is contention. But churches that are insider-focused, you know what they're full of? Contention, arguing, fighting amongst one another. It's all these rules that creates this contention. Look with me. Uh, look with me in verse 2, 3, 4. So we see this, that now this argument comes, this contention, and Paul and Barnabas were 
uh, sent out. The church sent them on their way. They traveled to Jerusalem. And then, they, verse number five, then some of the believers who belonged to the parties, they stood up and said, the Gentiles must be circumcised and required to keep the law of Moses. Do you see the, the focus of these believers in the church of Jerusalem? Did you see any recognition to the converts of the Gentiles? Any joy about people being saved and transformed in their life? Do you see any recognition to that? No, there's no recognition to that in the scripture. Actually, they stood up and you know what they wanted to talk about? The laws. You need to be circumcised. You need to obey the law of Moses. It, it, we have to be very careful as believers that we, when we lose our evangelistic zeal, and we're more concerned about rules and traditions and buildings and all of these things more than we are about reaching the unsaved. Is that not the purpose of why we gather? So they were more concerned with maintaining their traditions than they were about seeing people genuinely converted they really didn't want to talk about people being converted. They wanted to talk about the laws and the customs. Do you know how long it would take these people to learn all of these laws? Do you know that would require, before they could be part of this church, a complete lifestyle change? They would have to change their diet. They'd have to change their dress, what clothes they could wear, where they could go on Saturday. They would have to learn 613 different laws. So after much discussion, Peter stood up and he addressed them. He said, brothers, so we knew that these, these pharisaical, Judaizer type people were, he considered them brothers. Brothers, you know that some time ago God made a choice among us that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. So what does he say? How does he respond to these pharisaical believers? He says they, he wants them to change all of their outward appearance, their diet, their dress, their customs, where they go on Saturday. Peter stands up, and you know what he says? He goes, it's not about all of these things. Why? Because God is the one that sees their heart. It's not about what they put on on the outside. It matters about what's on the inside of a man that matters. So he says they're accepted just like us. This is the gospel movement. This is what it's about. It's not about these laws. It's not about these traditions. You're missing the point if that's what you think the gathering of believers is all about. It's about perfect people looking perfect and acting perfect. No, actually, the movement of the gospel is quite messy. Because we're not perfect. We don't have it all together, but we do have this common bond. What is that? The confession of our faith that Jesus Christ is Lord, and we are living on mission. We are pooling resources. We are living together to advance that confession to the world, right? That's what we should be about. And he says this, God did not discriminate between us and them. Why? Because he purified their hearts by what? By faith. So let me ask you this question. I need a volunteer. I don't have a volunteer, do I? I won't pick on you. I always pick on you. No. <laughs> Pastor Stuber, come here. Yeah, I haven't picked on him. He tries to be a deacon and sit in the back row and think, well, Pastor won't call me out if I sit way back here. All right, I want to do something here. So they're, they're in this church, right? There's this gathering of believers, and there's this group that rises up and say, you know, you know if you're going to be right with God, you got to adhere to all of the customs of the Judaizers, right? And Paul's this rebel. like He's like, no, the, and Peter's agreeing with him. These Gentiles are the uh, same standing with God as we are. These Judaizers are thinking, we're more right with God. So these people need to change and be like us for them to be as holy as we are. And then these other men are saying like, no, they're made right with God because it was by faith, Right? So I want to ask you a question. He's a Michigan State fan, right? Oh, yes. Okay. That's blasphemy. <laughs> I'm not. I'm a big Michigan fan, right? What would you say for him to be right with God, for it was for him to be a Michigan State fan, right? Or, or you know, he's, he's close. I'm closer to God. You know, he's wearing nice dress clothes. To be right with God, who do you think is closer? He's got nice clothes on, nice shirt, nice tie, nice coat, dress shoes, shoes shined. He's got it together, and I'm looking like a scrub. Judge us. Who's closer to God right now? You know, Pastor, you would be a lot more spiritual if you would just dress like him. 
Shine your shoes. And pastor, you know, abandon Michigan football. They're no good anyway, right? We actually beat you. And, you know, if you uh, like Michigan State and you, you wear a suit and tie and, and you dress like me, comb your hair like me, shave your beard like Dave, you'd be close with God. Isn't that what they're doing? So who do you think, if you're going to make a judgment, who do you think's more right with God? Who is it? Him? You guys are mean. <laughs> the point is, neither. Why? Because God has approved you by faith. My heart is made clean by justification by faith, just like his. It doesn't matter what it's wrapped up in. His heart's clean, just like mine. Not because we're good or we believe different things, but because of faith in Jesus Christ alone. Do you agree with that? You can go back to the back row. So this is that contention that's arising here. I remember this happening when I was at the rescue mission. You know, we, would, we were one of the only places. We'd take 60, 65 men. We would take men, uh, for you guys that don't know, my previous ministry, I was in inner city. We did rescue mission. We took men. But we would take men from the worst of the worst. We would take men that were involved with uh, Things with children and murder and, I mean, I mean I'm telling you, drugs, gangs, MS, I mean, I'm, we're talking, we would take men that no one else would take, okay? And they would come in, I'm talking Satan worshipers, I'm talking the people that society had thrown out, that's where they would come. And we would see men converted regularly. I, I, there's a man that's pastoring today that I, I, I know that he's a Satan worshiper, was a Satan worshiper, <laughs> Got to be careful with your words, Pastor. <laughs> he was a Satan. B.C., before Christ, he was a Satan worshiper. After Christ, he's radically changed. But, you know, he still has, like, satanic tattoos on his face and, you know, piercings, old piercings, and, you know, they, it just looks rough. And I remember we would travel to different places, and these men's lives were radically changed. I remember we would walk into churches, and you know what people would do? Because these men didn't have, like, suits and ties. They, 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 didn't have, uh, they didn't have the looks. They didn't have their hair all perfect. And, you know, they, uh, they were from a rescue mission. Most of them didn't have their teeth. They were involved in gangs. Some of them are like, these are scary bad dudes. Like, you know what would happen? We'd walk into a church. It was like the parting of the Red Sea. We'd walk in, and it was like looks of disgust. Looks of judgment. Looks of separation. Looks of... But I know that these men's hearts love Jesus. They were Satan worshipers, and now they love Jesus, and they, they preach the gospel. But I'm looking at these churches, and it wasn't the minority that would do that. It was the vast majority of churches. Anywhere we would go, we would be isolated. No one would shake their hands. No one would come up and talk to them. No one would say they love them. No one would say they're happy that they're in the Lord. There was no acceptance on the basis of what? They didn't fit the... Church mold. They didn't have all of this fancy, plastic-looking church mold. But you know what They one thing they did have? Jesus. And they loved Jesus. Let me tell you something. There is no difference if you've been in church for 40 years and you look like you have it all together than someone that was saved yesterday from a life of sin and drugs. There's no difference. You're not more right with God than they are. They have been approved by God by faith. So what happens here? Verse 10. Now, and then they said this. Why do you try to test God? By putting on the necks of Gentiles a yoke that neither we nor our ancestors have been able to bear. Do you see how creating these rule-based gatherings creates a barrier to the gospel to those that are far from God? When we create subcultures and we say, hey, if you want to be part of this subculture, this is what you got to do to be part, to be accepted, to be welcomed in our midst. Here's all the rules. And here, you know what's who's the, really the worst about this? Baptists. We're bad about it. You know what this place should be? This gathering of believers, remove the walls, remove everything, and it's just bare bones people. Do you know what this place should be? Is a place that is welcoming to all people from all walks of life, that when they come here, they are loved and they are accepted because our mission is one of grace and truth. But so many of the times we're all about just truth, truth, truth. 
that we avoid giving grace to people. Turn with me. I'll pull up here. I want you to see how this works practically. Look with me in 1 Corinthians 9. 1 Corinthians 9. I think Mitch can pull it up. In 1 Corinthians 9, verse 19 through 22. This is where we're going to look at the practical aspect of this. What does this look like? 1 Corinthians 9, verse 19. Look what it says. Paul here, even though he was Saul before, look what he says. Even though I'm a free man with no master, I have become a slave to all people. For what purpose? What's Paul's purpose? To bring many to Christ. What is that? Gospel movement, right? This is what he's living for, to see all people come to Christ. Look at the next verse, verse 20. So when I was with the Jews, just like he is within Jerusalem, look what he says. When I was with the Jews, I lived like a Jew. To bring the Jews to what? Do you see this movement here over and over? I lived like a Jew to bring the Jews to Christ. Grace and truth. What's the purpose? This balance is to live for the gospel. And when I was with those who follow Jewish law, I too lived under that law. Even though I'm not subject to the law, I did this so I could bring to Christ those who are under the law. So when Paul was around Jews, what did he live like? Did he have to subject himself to the law? No, but he did for what purpose? This is cultural contextualization. Cultural contextualization that big word that I just said right before, contextualization, is the most vital aspect to the gospel. But we mix up the two with syncretization. And we're going to divide them. So look what he says here. When I am with the Gentiles, Paul's a compromiser. Paul wouldn't be welcome. It'd be like this. It'd be like, you know, when I'm around the Baptist, I'm like a Baptist. I'm a really good Baptist. I live like Baptist. I'm just the best Baptist around. You know why I live like a Baptist? To see more Baptists saved. We need to see a lot more Baptists saved, right? But, you know, he's a compromiser. Watch him. Whoa, you big compromiser. You don't live like a Baptist when you go to the Gentiles. When you're with the Gentiles, you don't follow Jewish law. Look what it says. I, too, live apart from the law so that I can bring them to Christ. I don't ignore the law of God. I obey the law of Christ. So when Paul's around Jews and he is around Jewish culture, how does he live? Like a Jew. When he's with Gentiles and in Gentile culture, he acts like a Gentile. But what is the common theme? That he is preaching the truth of the gospel. Grace and truth. Does that make sense? Cultures will change and how we adapt to cultures will change. Eras and times change. Listen to me. Churches change. But the gospel in the truth never does. We have a really hard time accepting that. When I am with those who are weak, what do I do? I share their weakness. For when I want to bring the weak to Christ... Yes, I try to find common ground with everyone, doing everything I can to save the more. Grace, 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 all wrapped up in truth of the gospel. Do you see that? That's how we are to live, for the purpose that I may save the more. Do you remember, I want to share this story with you. Do you guys all know who Dwight L. Moody is? You ever heard of that early American revivalist? Good story. You know how he was viewed in his day? As an evil Satan worshiper. Dwight L. Moody saw thousands of people come to Christ. But there's, I can show you, I can pull up today, newspaper articles, full-length newspaper articles about how evil this man was. Do you know why? It wasn't that he preached the gospel. It wasn't that he saw thousands of people saved. Do you know why they declared him evil, these other ministers? He brought a piano into the tent revival. <gasps> How dare you bring a piano that is used in the saloons? The bars use pianos. How dare you use the piano to worship God? That is blasphemy, Dwight L. Moody. How dare you? Can you just see the similarities, Paul and his missionary journeys, and he's coming back and these Jews are like, and then we see it in the American culture, right? Do you know what it's like in our culture? Uh, this is going to get you all rattled up. Good. What would happen if we brought in a drum to a Baptist church? I've been told this. Pastor, the moment you bring in a drum, I'm out those doors. Why? That's evil. 
It says in the book of Second Opinions, thou shalt not play no drum. Okay. Do you know what they do in Africa? Do you know what happened if we just picked up First Baptist Church of America and brought First Baptist Church of America to First Baptist Church of Africa? Do you know what we'd have? We'd have Chris Petty on the bongo. We'd have Rainey as the First Baptist Steppers. We wouldn't wear collared shirts. We'd probably... Whatever that is that they wear. It would look a lot different. Why? Unless you're willing to move a grand piano across the continents. What was the difference? Culture. And let me tell you something. Culture will change. Truth never does. Now, I got to hurry. I want to finish this. This is what I want you to see. Remember I said I was going to say some controversial things. Stay with me. We're going to tie it all together. Okay? So he says this, verse 19, It's my judgment, therefore, that we shouldn't make it difficult for those Gentiles who are engaged with our culture to make it difficult for them that are being saved. This is what James said. If, if they shouldn't make it difficult for Gentiles who are being saved, what does the opposite implicate? That it should be easy for people who are far from God to be welcomed in our midst and to feel accepted. People should never feel judged or looked down upon. Our gatherings shouldn't be about rules, labels, and traditions. We are a movement of people with a gospel message. We make disciples. If it's of Jewish people, we will be like Jewish people. If it's of Gentiles, we'll be like Gentiles. We as a church should exist to make disciples of all people, regardless of where they are. And we will do all things to reach the more. Grace and truth. Does this describe our gathering? Or are we a church that argues over petty stuff? No implications there, Chris, anyway. We, listen to this, listen to this. You don't get anything, listen to this point. We must be careful. Listen, this is the healing balm of this message. We must be careful not to become unreasonable in our expectations of compatibility in our churches. There are some people in church who only see things one certain way, and only those who agree with them on every secondary doctrine, preference, and biblical, wow, biblical belief is right. You ever met people like that? Unless you believe like me on every single issue, you're a heretic. I call these people, these are hyper-separatist people. They demand complete conformity on a plethora of non-essential doctrines, but they will pretend to settle for compatibility. They say things like this, don't use that musical instrument, don't dress like that, don't watch that movie, your wife can't wear that in town, don't do this, don't do that. They say things like, um, they say things like that, they're demanding this conformity, these secondary issues. Listen to me, listen to me. When demanding conformity, listen to this quote, when demanding conformity and preferential matters is the lifeblood of a church, the gospel cannot be. Did you hear that? When demanding conformity in preferential matters is the lifeblood of the church, the gospel cannot be. Many hyper-separatists often supersede the authority of Scripture and demand that practice as doctrine, when in reality, it's just the traditions of men. We, as faithful ministers, must distinguish between cultural contextualization and syncretism. Syncretism, now listen to me, is terrible, it's awful, and should be separated from. But gospel contextualization is what every faithful minister of the gospel has done since the day Paul preached on Mars Hill. What syncretism is, and we must separate these two, syncretism is the mixing of society's religion into the doctrines of Christianity. The most notorious offender of this is the Roman Catholic Church. Throughout history, they have arrived in remote regions of the earth to, quote-unquote, evangelize. But what they would do is just add Jesus and the sacraments 
to the already established pagan beliefs of that culture, and it didn't really matter. So you didn't need to change. You didn't need to believe the gospel alone. It's just you can just add Jesus on top of it. This has prostituted the gospel and has led to an innumerable amount of false doctrines perpetuated by false converts. But contextualization, on the other hand, is to faithfully present the unaltered gospel message in the context of a particular culture. It is the reason Jesus wore sandals and not wingtips. It is the reason that he spoke Aramaic and not English. It is the reason he talked about seeds and farmers and fish and sheep rather than football, cars, and movies. It is a reason why so many pastors will dress like an American businessman to preach. And it's the exact reason why I'm not this morning. It is the reason why the music of the African bush sounds like it comes from Africa and not from America. The danger of hyper-separatist culture is that it conflates these two. It mixes these two. And we cannot distinguish between synchronism and contextualization. What we will do then when we can't separate the two is if you believe anything that the culture does, we'll say that guitar is evil or that piano is evil or this is evil. No, no, no. That's just cultural contextualization. We're not changing the truth. We're adapting to our culture. And that's okay. No amens there. Listen to me. If we do not separate these two and distinguish these two, if hyper-separatists do not separate these two, they wind up attempting to transplant a certain era of American cultural Christianity rather than advancing the gospel of Jesus Christ and making disciples. What we will do is we will spiritualize a certain era of Christianity, what the church used to be like in the 40s, what the church used to be like in the 50s, what it used to be like in the 60s and 70s, and what we'll do is we'll spiritualize it. The way they did it in the 40s, that's the right way, and if you don't do it that way, you're doing it the wrong way. No, the, what's happening, the church is adapting to culture, and that's okay if they maintain this balance of grace and truth, and the truth never changes. It's okay to change in cultural mores, but it's never okay to change the truth. We must separate these two. Churches that don't will seek to maintain traditions and maintain this, what we must, it's a culture of preservation. We must preserve the old ways and how we always used to, we must preserve. The church is never meant to preserve anything except the faith that was passed down to the saints once and for all. That's the gospel. But what we do, rules, boundaries, traditions, walls, buildings, where we're more concerned about all these little things instead of actually people not knowing Jesus and we get ourselves all wrapped up into arguing about the thermometers and carpets and instruments and we fight and we... You know what Satan's doing? (laughs) Because we're missing the point. We're missing the point. If we cannot distinguish these two, we will fall into the trap of thinking that we are the only ones who truly follow God in the true way. This is a very dangerous deception. Very dangerous. If someone's definition, listen to this, if someone's definition of preaching the gospel carries with it a mandate that others are required to look, act, feel, and think like them in order to truly follow Jesus, they are not bringing the gospel, but an idol in gospel wrapping paper. Why? Because we are made right with God By faith, my heart is just as right as your heart. So we have this natural tendency in churches to drift towards being insider focus and away from outsider focus. The Jewish believers were more comfortable around people who lived like them and acted like they did. You know what's true about it? So am I and so are you. We don't like to be around people who aren't like us, think like us, do we? We don't like to have hard conversations with, with people that think differently of us. It's easier, just much easier, just to demonize them. I'm good, you're bad. So we clump together like a five-year-old soccer team. 
Listen to me. It is easy as a church to cater to the paying customer. Where insider-focused churches complain and they, 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 they find fault with every little thing. But you know, people on the outside, they're just happy to know Jesus. Let me tell you something. A healthy church is a church that is on movement for the gospel. A dying church is a church that is focused about everything on the inside. It's a very unhealthy church. The natural tendency of the church is to drift towards law and away from grace or drift towards grace away from truth. My friends, we must work hard not to just be a truth, hard-nosed, rigid church, but we can also drift into error and question the inspiration of the Scripture to admit, to be able to be accepting and tolerant towards other views. No, we must be graceful on all spectrums while still maintaining truth. We must work hard at that. Jews thought of terms of categories. The Jews are in, the Gentiles are out. Jews are good, people outside are bad. It's an us versus them mentality. That's not the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel is I am for everybody. And I'm going to tell everybody. The Jews were trying to protect their God-given traditions and laws. They're trying to preserve that culture and this add Jesus onto this already Jewish culture. So as long as we can be Jewish and add Jesus onto it, we'll accept it. The church gravitates towards categories and policies. Do you know the church used to practice segregation? Most Baptist seminaries didn't take interracial marriages out of their bylaws up until 2014. Well, no one says anything about that. In the 70s, you couldn't be divorced. In the church. You're just blacklisted. You're divorced, you're bad. Evil, devil worship. Give me a break. Rules, rules, rules. Labels, labels, labels. We need fewer policies and more conversations. Church is messy. Let me tell you something. You may look good right now. Let me tell you something. As a pastor, and I love you deeply, and I try to be involved in your life as much as possible, can I say this with the most grace? All of your lives are a mess. Let me help you with something. So is mine. It's okay. Church is messy. When we get together in small group, it's okay to be messy. We don't have to be perfect. It's messy. The Jews were trying to have a culture of preservation. But in the process, it created a barrier to what God was doing. Listen, they were serving the created rather than the creator. It was about them and not about him. God has not called us to preserve anything. This gathering of people lives to impact this generation of people. We need to be a church that moves, that lives, that marches, that arises. So three things. That was my introduction. We'll go into my, I'm kidding. So we must work hard not to drift into just truth. We must work hard not to drift into just grace, but to maintain this balance. And there's three commitments I want to ask of you. Let's be more concerned with who we are reaching rather than who we are keeping and what we are keeping. Do you understand that? How much of us get upset about things that we're trying to preserve and our hearts are not even motivated about who we're not reaching. That should cause us great repentance. Because that's in my heart too. I get caught up with all the administration and the budgets and these line items and this meeting and that meeting and this policy and this constitution and that line and this line. And you know what I forget about and all this church stuff? I forget about my neighbor. I can't even remember the last time I even talked to my neighbor. That should bother us. 
It should bother us when we fight and argue about silly stuff and we don't even talk about reaching our neighbors. That should really, really bother us to our core. We should repent of all these traditions and laws that have hindered the gospel. We should. Get mad at me all you want. This is the time for repentance in the church. Let's always be more concerned about who we're reaching rather than what we are keeping and preserving. Let's always try to work hard to maintain a spirit of grace and truth. If someone walks into our church, the moment they walk in in this gathering, you know what they should be flooded with? Acceptance and love and having conversations with them, inviting them out to dinner when we can go out to dinner. Isn't that, shouldn't that be our culture? Instead of looks, distance. And James was right. We shouldn't put a yoke of bondage on people. We shouldn't have these expectations for them to change before we accept them. We should not make it difficult for those who are far from God and are turning to God to come be in our gathering. Do you agree with that? Because church, what is the church? It's a people that are surrounded by one thing, that Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior. And what do we do? We work together as a collective body. We pool together our resources. We do everything in our power to reach the world for Jesus Christ. That is the church. We must reset our thinking because we have been caught up in so many extra things that have nothing to do with God. Because what is our message? Our message is that Jesus has come to save the hardened pharisaical heart, those that think of their own self-righteousness and their own goodness, that think that because they're moral and good that they'll be accepted. But you know what the message is? It's also the same message to the down and out, the prostitute, the tax collectors, the sinners, the publicans, all those people that society has outcasted. It is the same message for all that Jesus has come to save you from your sin. And do you know what that does when when people believe and repent and believe? Guess what? They are saved and, and gloriously saved. Not just for a day, not for a week. They are saved eternally and forever. Their souls are rescued. Isn't that the only thing that really matters in light of eternity? Are really, when we get to heaven and we stand before God and we get to look, if we get to look back on things and we look at the church and we look at how we gathered and how we argued over stupid things, do you think those things that we got so wound up about are really going to matter? You know what's really going to matter? Is did I live my life on mission to reach people with the gospel of Jesus Christ? That's what's going to matter. That's what's going to matter. Let's pray. Father, Thank you for your word. Lord, it was a hard word. Lord, it's difficult to hear, but Lord, it's right where we are at. Father, I ask that you would help us. Lord, this is difficult. This is hard. It goes against our grain. It makes us uncomfortable. But God, it's truth. God, I pray that you would help us to remove every barrier that is not according to your word. Father, every commandment, every preference, every tradition that we've established, that you would break them down, that, God, you would make this church, this gathering of believers, as a people that confess Christ as Lord and that live on mission together to see disciples made. And, Lord, that you would remove every barrier, that you would give us an eternal focus, God, that we would be accepting of one another in all of our differences, in all of our preferences, in all of the different things that we think about, that we wouldn't demand extra weights on people, that it would be a culture of acceptance and love and truth. And Father, that it would bring glory to your name and that you would be glorified in our midst. God, purify us. Change us. Let us have hearts of repentance. God, my heart repents. Help us, God, to have hearts that are on fire for the mission of the gospel, that we would not make church something that it's not. 
Father, be glorified in this time as we sing. We pray in Christ's name. Amen.